only Jesus could have brought together Tony Dungy, JB, Dave Hinton, me, and you. And just think of the racial difference, the redneck, the, uh, the hick, and, and yet we all love each other. And it, we got a great family. It's just great to have all of these different family members together. You know, Dave Hinton, I I love the way he does things here, and it's awesome. But his real anointing is like he's talking about in schools, biker bars, and he has led, who knows, thousands, tens of thousands of people to the Lord. And man, what an honor to have him doing this. And, And he's just anointed. It's awesome. You know, there's not a one of us that is the total expression of Jesus. And we need each other. And sad to say, we often feel intimidated by each other and competitive, and it shouldn't be that way. You know, Tony and JB and me and all of the different people, the praise and worship and Dave Hinton and stuff, each one of us has something that we contribute. And you just have to be comfortable being who you are, just as Dave was talking about. Dave doesn't try and be like Daniel Amstutz and stuff. And And each one of us are unique. And if you would find what God has for you and just do it, man, what an awesome impact we would all make. I think I said this on Thursday night, but you know, this many people, we all go back to the places that we came from. We've got people here from Sri Lanka, or excuse me, not Sri Lanka. Where where were you from? Dubai. (laughs) I was thinking of another guy. Uh, but we got people here from Dubai and we've got them from South Africa and we've got them all over the world, all over the United States. And if everybody just went back and took this joy and this love of God and ministered to people, this would have a worldwide impact. Every one of us just do our part. What I want to share with you this morning, I felt really impressed to do this. I know that many of you have been touched by the Lord in a significant way. I know that that very first night, a lot of people got born again, baptized in the Holy Spirit. And since then, every service, people have been getting touched. But uh, I was in Louisville, Kentucky. This has been 30 years ago or something like this. And I was holding a meeting there, and a woman came up to me on a Sunday. It started on Wednesday night, and on Sunday morning, she came up and she says, I have never felt the love of God like this in my life. She says, my life is totally changed. And she was just so happy. But then she said, I know it won't last, but for the next week or something, I'm going to really enjoy this. And when she said that, it hurt me. It bothered me to think that people just anticipated losing it. And as I thought about it, I thought, you know, this really is typical. It's not the way it should be, but that really is typical. And I bet you that there are many people sitting right here that you've had God touched you in the past. And man, you had some kind of a a experience with the Lord and you thought I'll never get over it. And yet in a brief period of time, it seems like you go back to the way that you were. And I think that the average Christian really does believe that you just go from these mountain peaks to mountain peaks. You go from highs and lows and they accept this as the way it's supposed to be. But as I heard this woman say this, man, I, that was on a Sunday morning, Sunday afternoon. I spent all afternoon just praying and saying, God, this is wrong. How can I help people? And I'm not saying this in a bragging way at all. I'm saying this in a thankful way. But the Lord touched my life March the 23rd, 1968, and I have never gotten over it, and I'll never get over it. And it is more real to me today, and I am benefiting from it more today than I did back in 1968. And I believe that the Scripture teaches that Jesus came, you know, to bring the mountains down and exalt the valleys is what it says. And if you bring the mountains down and the valleys up, that means it should be a level plain. We shouldn't have to go through these highs and lows. Now, God knows people do it and God's not mad at you and he loves you. But I'm saying that's not the way that God ordained it to be. And I spent all afternoon saying, Lord, how has this worked in my life? And God just spoke things to me that I had lived. It's not like he showed this to me and then that caused me to be able to live it. But it's just what I lived. And then he explained to me that this is how you've been able to do that. So I want to share that with you today because I know that many of you have been touched and and you've made some commitments and you want to leave this place and see it make a difference in your life. And yet many of you may just be expecting that this won't last because this is the way it's been in the past. I want to share some things with you from Romans chapter one right here. And the Lord gave me these verses about how you stay full of God. 
And let me just make a statement. The average person believes that it's up to God whether you are happy, blessed, anointed, excited. They, if, if you have a deficiency in your life and you don't feel loved, the average person, oh God, just touch me and pour out your love in my life. That's wrong because you've already accepted that it's not your fault. There's nothing you can do about it. God, I need you to love me. The scripture teaches that God has already abounded towards us with love. You have love, joy, and peace, long suffering, all these things in your spirit. God has already done his part. If you aren't feeling the love of God, it's not God that hasn't loved you. It's you that somehow or another has done something that has taken your attention off of it. And you're the one that has stopped the flow of God's love. God's not the one standing there with his hand on the faucet controlling whether or not you're happy and full of joy and full of power. God wants you to be happy and blessed and anointed and on fire more than you want it. It is never God that you have to go and say, oh God, touch my life and oh God, do something. God has done his part. There's things that you need to do in order to receive. And this is what Romans chapter one is about. I could spend 30 minutes, which I haven't got introducing this, but real quickly, he just said in verses 16 and 17, it's the gospel the grace of God that is the power of God unto salvation. When he says that, people are immediately going to say, no, you've got to let people know that they're sinners and they're going to hell. Verses 18 through 20 are saying, no, everybody has an intuitive knowledge of right and wrong. Everybody, everybody knows that there is only one God and you are not him. Now you can get into a mind game where you start you know, listening to other people and stuff, and you can deaden yourself to that. And that's what Romans chapter one is describing. It describes progressive steps that people take away from this intuitive knowledge about God. But everybody, everybody knows there is a God. When I was in Vietnam, there was people, I'm an atheist, but boy, when the bombs got to dropping and the bullets flying, every one of these atheists cried out to God. Every one of them. If somebody tells you they don't believe there's a God, they're lying. Now they may have deadened themselves and they may be wanting to believe there's no God so that they can justify the way they're living. But I can guarantee you based on Romans 1, 18 through 20, God has revealed himself from heaven against all ungodliness and all unrighteousness of men who hold the truth of God in unrighteousness. They know it. There's this intuitive knowledge so that even his eternal power and Godhead are known. Man, I could preach on that for an hour. So that's the background. But in verse 21, he begins to show how you can deaden yourself. You can walk away from this knowledge. And the same thing is true of what you've experienced here. If God has spoken to you, if you've made a commitment to him and you're wondering about, am I going to be able to continue this on my own when I get back home? For you to lose what God has done in your life, you have to go through these four things that are listed in Romans 1, you have to do this. You cannot have what God has done in your life diminish, loosen, lessen its power without you doing these four things. So what I want to do is identify this, turn it around and say, don't do these four things. Do the opposite and you can keep the things of God fresh. And again, I'm a testimony that, man, it's now been uh, two weeks from yesterday. It will be 50 years since God's touched my life and it has never diminished. It's gotten stronger. Pastor Dwayne Sheriff down here, we were sharing at one of our meals about how he had a vision of Jesus dying on the cross. And then he recognized he died on that cross. And that's been how many years, Dwayne? 38 years. And I guarantee you it's as real in Dwayne today as it's ever been. And I could go right down the row right here and talk about all of these people that God has touched their life. And you don't have to lose the blessing and the joy of the Lord. It's up to you. You're the one that controls this. And some people think, well, I, that doesn't bless me because you mean it's my fault. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> But you know what? When you understand it's your fault, well, then you can do something about it. If it's just like, well, this is the way God does it, mountaintops and valleys, and you go through the valley because that's where the gr green is, that's where the water is, and you grow. And these religious things that we've come up with to justify you being carnal, right. it's wrong. Amen. I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, God, brothers and sisters, well, that's for those of you watching. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
some of you may feel like a sister every once in a while. <laughs> you just check your plumbing and whatever your plumbing is, that's who you are. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. It's up to you whether you have the joy of the Lord, whether you are built up, it's up to you. And instead of condemning you, that ought to encourage you that praise God, I can do this through the power of God with the Holy Spirit. I can do this. You can go out of here and be as strong as horseradish. Amen. Amen. So in Romans chapter one, verse 21, he starts talking about the progressive steps that you take away from God. It says, because that when they knew God, they glorified him, not as God. That's number one. Neither were thankful. That's number two, but became vain in their imaginations. That's number three. And their foolish heart was darkened. Now this may take a little bit of explanation. That's what I want to do in the next 30 minutes here. But these are things that you have to do to lose the joy of the Lord, to lose your, your excitement, to lose your commitment, to lose your enthusiasm. You've got to do these things or God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He doesn't just come and go. It's not God that touches you and leaves you. It's all up to you. So what does this mean? When I first started seeing this, I immediately related to the, the uh, last three things. But the first thing, when it says they didn't glorify him as God, when I saw that, I said, God, I don't understand exactly what that means. So I went and looked up the word glorify in the uh, Strong's Concordance, and it means to render or esteem glorious. It used the word glorious to define glorify. And it didn't help me a bit. <laughs> so I, I kept praying about this and thinking about it. And then I went to a dictionary and just looked up each one of these words to render, esteem, Glorious. And when I got to the word esteem, the word esteem means to value or to prize, to place value upon. And when I saw this, man, it just opened up to me. And I want to share this with you. I don't know if I'll be able to get through this whole thing this morning, but I've got a, a series, a five part series on this four keys to staying full of God. But I saw that this is exactly what happened in my life. I had this experience on March the 23rd, 1968. And I mean, God just transformed my life. The next morning in my Baptist church, I was 18 years old and I got up in front of our Baptist church and I was an introvert. This was unusual for me, but I was so fired up, so turned on, so in love with God that I stood in front of my Baptist church and uh, I used to rededicate my life and do all this stuff every time they gave an invitation. But I got up and I told the people, I said, I'll never rededicate my life again. Never. I said, I gave God everything I've got last night. And I said, there is nothing left to give. I said, I'll never have to rededicate. And I said, I'm filled with the spirit. And I didn't know what I was saying. I was 18 years old and I was just trying to express that God had touched me and filled me with his spirit. And, and I was telling them about how awesome God was. Man, you, you know, if I would have committed adultery, they would have been merciful, more merciful to me. <laughs> but to say that I was filled with the spirit, the pastor got up right after I got up and says, who do you think you are to claim that you are filled with the spirit like the apostle Paul, like Peter and just ridicule me. 18 years old. And then all kinds of people came against me and I could, I could spend an hour, I could spend days telling you about the criticisms that came my way. But you know what? Here it was. I was glorifying God. I was placing value on what God had done in my life. God told me he loved me. And the moment I did it, other people started criticizing me and I had a choice. Am I going to value their opinion? more than I value God. Matter of fact, I do it like this. Like if you had a seesaw, did you know that you can't have both ends up at one time? <laughs> if you have this end up, then this one, you know, has to go down and vice versa. And, the, and if you are glorifying God and if you're saying, God, thank you for touching my life at the men's advance. Thank you for doing this. And oh God, I love you. And I'm never going to be th the same. I've made commitments. And if you are placing value on that and glorifying that, you go home and I can guarantee you, somebody's going to try and devalue your experience. 
Somebody, you know, if you go up to work and say, man, I just heard these guys speaking. It touched my life and I'm a different man. There's people that look at you because they aren't here and you look the same in the natural. They're going to devalue what you've done. And they're going to say, you aren't any different. They, Satan will find people to come across your path. that will push your buttons. They will try and get you out of there. And you've got a choice. Are you going to continue to glorify God and say, no, I'm, an, I'm giving my life to the Lord. I'm putting him first. Or are you going to value other people's opinion? And if you do, the moment you start saying, but the pastor spoke against me, but my friends don't understand. And if you value, if you esteem what they've said, you have quit glorifying God. You have quit placing value on what he said. You've got to get to a place that what God says about you is all it counts. It doesn't matter what somebody else says. If somebody stands up during your offering and yells at you, who cares, amen? <laughs> God Almighty has said this. And did you know, I, the, a lot of things happened, but the Lord, I was in my first year of school. The Lord told me to quit uh, secular school. And I had a deferment from the military as long as I stayed in school. I was getting $350 a month from government uh, for my dad's social security if I stayed in school. And uh, I had the acceptance of everybody, everybody in my family, everybody, everybody but me has gone through college. I have my own Bible college and I'm a college dropout. <laughs> Go figure. And so there was a lot on the line. And when I said that God told me to quit school, boy, the feathers hit the fan. <laughs> my mother who my dad died when I was 12 years old. My brother went off the rails and he was in jail and did some things. And he's a good guy, but it just took him a little while to find the path. And my mother would stay up at night and cry. And my mother and I were really, really close. I mean, we did everything together. And when I said that the Lord told me to quit school, my mother didn't talk to me for two weeks. She wouldn't say a word. She couldn't talk to me. And finally I took her out to eat and I said, you are going to talk to me. And she just started crying. And she says, I'm so ashamed. And she says, you know, I've raised you to be better than this. And I had a choice of, am I going to value my mother's opinion and, and devalue what God has done and what God said? I'm telling you, this is, a, it's subtle, but, but that's exactly what happens. If somebody saying things to you and all of a sudden you want their approval, you esteem, you value their opinion more than you value God's opinion, then boom, all of a sudden you lose this and you don't have the same joy and the peace and you wonder what happened. It's because you, it was more important to you what people thought about you. And you know, by the grace of God, I was able to walk through that. And my mother became a great supporter of mine, worked for me. She, you know, she came around. God appeared to her in a dream, told her I was doing exactly what he told me to do and she better take her hands off of me or else. And it changed. <laughs> but you know, during this time, I, uh, when I quit school, I got uh, a notice to go apply for the draft. Uh, I mean, I got a notice to go get a physical in preparation of the draft, pre-induction physical. So anyway, I went and I passed. And when I came back, uh, I remember a recruiter walking into my house. Now, by this time, I was about 19 years old, and it had been a few months after this experience, and uh, this recruiter came in. He was like 35 years old or something, and he came in and opened up his briefcase and spread out all of this material about all of the advantages of volunteering for the draft instead of being drafted. And he started into his spill, and I just stopped him. I said, I can say both of us a lot of times. And he says, how's that? And I said, the reason I was classified 1A and the reason I went for my pre-induction physical is because I quit school. And he said, that's right. And I said, God told me to quit school. And so therefore God's responsible for whatever happens. So I don't care what happens. I'm not going to volunteer for the draft. I said, God's in control. And if he wants me drafted, I'll be drafted. And if he doesn't, I won't. And this, this, uh, recruiter laughed at me. He laughed out loud and he says, boy, I can guarantee you, you are going to Vietnam. 
And when he said that, see, here I was valuing God. God spoke to me. God's in control of my life. Here came somebody who represented the United States government that didn't value God, laughed at my opinion and scorned it. And you know what? Again, I, I don't even know how this happened, except that I was just so in love with the Lord, I didn't really think about it. But most people I imagine would have immediately right then, this guy represents the U.S. government. This guy has my fate in his hands. And they would have valued his opinion. And the moment you value that, the value you've placed on God comes down and you begin to start losing your joy and peace about it. But man, when he did that, it made me mad. Here I was, a 19-year-old kid talking to a 35-year-old man who was representing the government. And I just stood up and I put my finger right in his chest like this. And I said, man, if God, God spoke to me and if God wants me drafted, I'll be drafted. And if he doesn't, I said, you are the United States government or every demon in hell cannot draft me. And this guy just looked at me. He put up all his stuff. He never said a word and just put it in his briefcase and walked out. And the next day I had my draft notice in the mail. I wished I would have gone to see if it had a postmark on it. I believe he probably went and processed it himself and put it in there. I don't know, but I didn't care. And see, here's all of these things come against you to make you devalue what God has said and think, well, maybe I was just emotional. Maybe, you know, this was just a bunch of guys together and stuff. But if you would just keep esteeming and valuing God and what he says about you, you can't lose what he's done. You're the one that does this. You know, you may not think of it this way, but every one of you value things constantly. There's people that have been here this week and there's some that came and they didn't value what's going on. They disesteemed it. You know, just the opposite of what I'm talking about, it says in Hebrews chapter 12, verse one, it says, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him despised, or uh, how does it go? What's verse two? Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. The word despising right there is the exact same word with a prefix to it. Instead of exalting the shame, he devalued the shame. It's the exact same word. It's the opposite. He despised the shame. He devalued the shame. He didn't focus on the shame. And this is what you've got to do. You've not only got to value and, and prize God, but you've got to devalue anything or anyone else that comes along. Everything else in comparison to God has to be nothing in comparison. You know, there was a friend of mine, we were hiking up Pikes Peak one time and uh, it was like a two, three hour hike. And we were going up there and there's a mutual friend of ours who pastors a church who um, he's a friend and a foe all at the same time. He's done some good things for us, but he just is very critical and tells people bad things about us all the time. And he's done a lot of damage. And anyway, as we were hiking up uh, Pike's Peak, he was saying, have you heard what so-and-so said about you lately? And I said, no, I hadn't heard. So he started to tell me and I said, I don't care to hear. I said, I just as soon not hear it. So he stopped and after 10 minutes he says, but he said this about you. And he started in again. And I said, look, I don't want to hear it. And so finally we took a rest and we were sitting there resting. He says, why doesn't it bother you what he says about you? And I said, because I don't value his opinion the way you do. In the scriptural term, I don't glorify his opinion. It really doesn't matter to me what anybody thinks about me, but Jesus. If I feel that Jesus is pleased, if I'm doing what Jesus wants me to do, I don't esteem anybody else. I don't do it perfectly, but this is, this is what I desire to do is to glorify God. And see, before Satan can steal from you anything God has given you, you have to disesteem what God has done. 
You have to devalue it and value somebody else. And some people think, well, I still value God, but I also want these people. You, you can't do it this way. It's got to be, it's got to be you value what God says. And in comparison, everybody and everything else is nothing in comparison. If you would do that and continue to do it, I guarantee you what God has spoken into your life, what God has done, it'll stay just as fresh as it can be. And I'm running through this real quickly. Again, I encourage you to get that serious. But if you were to turn over to Psalms chapter 69, let me read this to you in Psalms chapter 69. This is a prophetic Psalm about Jesus. And Jesus was actually the one speaking this. There's four different times that it's quoted here in Psalms chapter 69. And let me find this verse, Psalm 69. And um, verse 30, it says, I will praise the name of God with a song and I will magnify him with thanksgiving. The reason I bring this out is because the second thing listed over there in Romans 1 21, it says they weren't, they didn't glorify God. The second thing, they weren't thankful. Did you know that the word that was translated thankful in the Greek is the exact same word? Keep your finger here, <laughs> look in Romans chapter 13. And um, let me see if I can find this verse. I should have looked this up. In Romans chapter 11, verse 13. <coughs> Paul is speaking and he says, for I speak to you Gentiles inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify my office. Did you know that the word magnify there is the exact same Greek word as glorify in Romans 1 21. So one of the ways that you glorify the Lord is to magnify the Lord. And how do you magnify the Lord? In Psalms chapter 69, and in verse 30, I will praise the name of God with a song and will magnify him with thanksgiving. You magnify God when you are thankful. Did you know that being unthankful is one of the traits of the last time? Second Timothy chapter three, verses one through five lists that in the end times, all of these things will happen and it lists 16 things. And one of them is that men will be unthankful. Did you know that being unthankful is ungodly? When you, when you are thankful, it does a number of things. For one thing, it humbles you. You're admitting that I am not the source of everything. And you know, I think it was either JB or Tony, I forget which one, but they alluded to this, that men are, you know, big and look, man, I did this. I'm a self-made man and stuff like this. And we're big on depending on ourselves. But the truth is God is the source of everything. You did not create you. You didn't have a thing to do with you being here. You did not give you your talents and abilities. You didn't give you your strength. You didn't cause you to be born at this time in history. You aren't the one who made you be born uh, in a nation where there's unparalleled uh, opportunities. You are not the source of anything. All the Lord would have to do is just stir the chemicals in your brain a little bit and you'd be able to lick stamps off the drool that's coming <laughs> off your chin. You aren't the source of anything. Well, no, I worked and I did this and I went to school. You may have developed something, but you can't develop what God didn't put in there. God is the source of everything. And if you begin to start recognizing God, you, thank you. Thank you for giving me life. Thank you that you revealed yourself to me. Thank you that I got born again. Thank you, Father. You know, I don't know each one of y'all's experience, but I know that many of you are headed to hell, man, on, in a hurry. All of us were, but I mean, some of you were just out there living a terrible life and God just arrested you and brought you around. You weren't seeking God. We say things like, you know, I found God, but God wasn't the one that was lost. God found you. You ought to be thanking God and saying, Father, thank you for saving me. Thank you. There's some of you that your friends brought you to this thing and man, God's touched your life. You ought to be thanking God that you had friends that cared about you and that were praying for you. Some of you, your wives have been praying for you and praying that, oh God, change that man while he's here. You ought to be thanking God that you have a wife that prayed for you. God's the one that gave you your opportunities. He gave you your strength. God is the source of everything. And when you begin to say, Father, thank you. 
man, it makes you realize that you aren't the source. You may have worked. You know, there's so many things I'd love to say right here, but let me just quickly say this. It says over in Colossians chapter two, verses 16 and 17, it, it says that the Sabbath was a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. It was a shadow. You know, if you could imagine this pulpit here, like being a building or something like this, it went up to the roof. And if I was standing here and if you were standing over there and you couldn't see me because this was blocking our view, but if you could see my shadow, did you know a shadow can give you information? It's important. It could tell you if I'm standing still, if I'm moving towards you, if I'm moving away from you, if I was carrying something. If you can't see me, a shadow's important. But once I step around the corner and you see me, something would be weird with you if you went up and shook hands with my shadow or hugged my shadow. Once you get the person, forget the shadow. The Sabbath was a shadow, a picture of something. And yet today people observe the shadow and they are fanatic about, they've got to keep the shadow. And Hebrews chapter four shows you what it was a shadow of. It was a shadow of a relationship with the Lord. And here's the point. When God gave the Sabbath, all of the nations in the world were working seven days a week. And I mean, they worked up from sun, sun up to sundown. This 40 hour week is a relatively new thing. We are some of the few people in the history of the world that have ever worked as little as we work. Most people work daylight till dark, seven days a week. God tells his people, take one day off. That was radical. And people immediately think, how am I going to prosper if I work one seventh less than what I, everybody else is doing? But God says, I'll bless you. And the nation prospered more than the people that work seven out of seven days. And just in case anybody missed that, Leviticus chapter 25 says you have to take one year out of every seven off. And he says in Leviticus 25, somewhere around verse 25, it says, if the people will say, what will we eat during the seventh year? He says, I'll give you three times a normal crop on the sixth year to carry you through the sixth year, through the seventh year, and through the eighth year while you're planting your crops and waiting on them to come up. If anybody missed the weekly Sabbath, how could you miss this yearly Sabbath where you take one year out of seven off? And it showed that even though you work, See, if you don't understand it, you'll think, I plowed this ground. I remember seeing a, a movie. I forgot what it was now, but it was Jimmy Stewart. Jimmy Stewart, what was the movie? Shenandoah. And anyway, his wife, or I think it was, wanted him to pray over the meal. So he prayed and he says, I plowed this ground. I removed the rocks. I did all of this, but thank you. And it was, like, it was real sarcastic the way he did it. Like he didn't believe a bit of it. He says, I produced this food. But just to please his wife, he says, thank you for giving us this food. And if you aren't careful, you'll get to thinking, I'm the one that produced this money. I'm the one who works all this job. I'm the one who does all of this. Again, God is your source. Man, you could enter into that sudden death that James Brown was talking about at any moment. If you think that you're the one that's doing everything, Man, you're missing it. See, this is what giving is all about. God doesn't need your money, but God needs to, you to recognize him as, as your source. And so he says, give me 10%. Not because he needs your money. He wants you to trust him and say, God, you're my source. And I'm not just going to say it. I'm going to prove it. I believe it. And here's the first fruits. The very first thing I do, I give it back to you because without you, I wouldn't be able to do anything. If you aren't a giver, you aren't a thankful person. That's right. That's good. You think you're doing it all on yourself and you think that this is my money. Truth is God's the source of everything you've got and you're just honoring him. It says in Proverbs chapter three, honor the Lord with your substance and with the first fruits of your increase. You honor the Lord when you give. You don't honor him. You aren't thankful when you aren't a giver. You are trusting in yourself. You're thinking it's your work that's producing this. And so that's what's behind the Sabbath. That's what's behind everything. What you're doing basically is you're glorifying God. You're magnifying God. When you are thankful and you say, Father, you're the source of everything. Without you, I can do nothing. You know what? You are thankful and that's magnifying the Lord. It makes God bigger. 
and it's glorifying him. Again, those words were used interchangeably. So these first two things we're talking about, you've got to glorify the Lord. You've got to esteem and place value on him and you've got to be thankful. They're really the same thing. You can't truly esteem God and glorify him if you aren't thankful for what he's done for you. And I tell you, the world, we live in a fallen world and there's just negative things that happen to you. I have a lot of negative things happen to me and you know, I've got challenges that most of you, if I was to tell you some of the challenges that I've got, I could make you feel sorry for me. I got plenty of problems, but I choose to diminish them, to disesteem all of the things I don't have. And what I do, I magnify God and I focus on what I do have. And I'm just thankful, 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 thankful. I constantly am praising God and thanking God. And by doing that, it keeps God glorified. It makes me thankful. And I wish I had time to go through all of these things. But the next thing it talks about, your imagination becomes vain. I've got an entire teaching on imagination that is really powerful. But your imagination is just your ability to picture something. It's not fantasy. It's imagine, imagination. It's just a mental image. Like if I was to tell you right now that, you know, when we exit this place, when you get down there to the light, did you know that there's a double left turn lane? Most people hadn't figured that out. I was going out last night and everybody's in single file. You can turn from both left lanes. And some of you think, oh, oh, and you know what? You're seeing it. That's your imagination. If I was to say, where do you go? How do you get to Woodland Park? What, do you turn right or left at the light? You, you can't see the light from here, but you can see it. If I was to ask you, how many windows do you have in your bedroom at home? You've probably never sat down and counted it, but you could tell me because you can see it. That's your imagination. You can't function without an imagination. And it says that if you don't glorify God, if you don't esteem him, if you aren't thankful, if you aren't magnifying God, then your imagination becomes vain. That doesn't mean it quits working. It means it starts working against you. You will start picturing failure instead of success. Whether you realize it or not, every one of you have an image of you on the inside. You know, if I was to talk to you on the phone and you said you're coming to the men's advance and I say, well, who are you? You could describe yourself, whether you're white, black, Hispanic, whatever. You could tell me how tall you are. You could tell me what your hair is like if you got any. You could, you could tell me a lot of things about yourself. But if I was to say, but what's your personality like? Did you know you've got a picture of you? And you could say, oh, I'm an extrovert. Or, oh, I'm an introvert. And... You have an image on the inside of you that limits what God can do with you. Man, I got so much I'd like to say in eight minutes and 30 seconds. But did you, I've got a whole series entitled Don't Limit God. And God showed me I was going to have a worldwide ministry. I was going to be touching people all over the world. I knew it. If you would have asked me, I could have repeated it to you, but I didn't see myself doing it. I wouldn't allow myself to see. And there's reasons for that. Part of it is that for decades, it wasn't time yet. And I just had to be where I was and it wasn't appropriate for me. But the Lord spoke to me January 31st, 2002 and told me I was limiting him by my small thinking. And a lot of it, there was a lot of things, but a lot of it was I wouldn't let myself see me reaching people like that. I wouldn't, I couldn't see me doing this. I knew that this is what God wanted, but I hadn't seen it. That's your imagination. And I had to sit down and change the way I saw myself and change what I saw that I could do. And I had to start imagining things. Did you know everything you're seeing right here? This was all inside of me. I saw all of this. I designed all of this. I designed everything, all of these buildings and everything. I saw it. I sat down and I would spend hours imagining. Now, I didn't, you know, make the physical plans. I couldn't do that. But I drew all of this on a piece of paper and showed it to people. And then they'd come back and draw it. And I'd say, nope, that's not what I've seen. Everything you're seeing, it was on the inside of me. I've seen this. And, and I had to see it on the inside before I could see it on the outside. It's the same with you. And you, 
If you don't glorify God and if you aren't thankful and if you get to where you start taking the burden and the responsibility, I've got to make this work instead of thinking, God, I'm just responding to your ability. It's not my responsibility. It's my response to your ability. Unless you get that right, you will start disesteeming God. You'll look at yourself. You'll think you are doing things and your imagination will just start seeing failure instead of seeing success. You'll see your marriage falling apart instead of being better. You'll see your business failing. You'll see that I can't do anything. And it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. And when that happens, when your imagination becomes darkened, I mean, becomes vain, then your heart becomes darkened. And man, I've got an entire series entitled Hardness, a heart that will go into explanation on this, but you cannot function differently than your heart. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Proverbs 23, 7. And your heart determines how your life goes. Your life is going the direction that your heart is going. With your head, you may know that this is not the right thing to do, but if your heart is in a different direction, you, you will ultimately go the direction of your heart. And your heart becomes darkened, becomes clouded, hardened towards God. If you don't glorify God, if you don't magnify Him with thanksgiving, if you don't use your imagination properly to see the right things, then it's just, there, it's a progressive step. It's not like you have to do three out of four. No, you have to do all four of these. And it has to start with placing value on what God has done. And you magnify Him through thanksgiving. You need to be a constantly praising God person. And you know, I don't do this perfectly, but I guarantee you, I do it more than I've ever done it. And um, I do it a lot. I, my prayer life is probably 90% just praise and thanksgiving. There's very few things I ever ask God for. I thank God. I was coming in today thanking God for the massage on my seat. It's awesome. And I know, so, well, I'd never thank God for, well, I would. I did. I thank God for the massage. God gave me that truck as a gift. Man, I praise God for the beautiful place that we live in. I praise God for all of you being here. I ministered for nearly two decades and the largest crowd I ever had was 15 or 20. And now we, we're having to build bigger buildings to accommodate people. And I just praise God constantly for those stuff. And I'm telling you, if you, if, you can check your spiritual pulse by checking your praise. You know, if somebody fell over dead, first thing you do is go check their pulse. Are they still, is their heart beating? And if they don't have any pulse, they're dead. If you don't have any thanksgiving, you're dead. Well, you don't understand my problems. You don't understand how good it is. It could be worse. Man. It could be worse than what it is. You ought to thank God that things are as good as they are. And if nothing works in this life, I had a person come to me one time, but I'm going through a divorce. You can't be thankful going through a divorce. Why not? <laughs> if nothing else, you ought to say, well, thank you, Jesus. And in heaven, they don't marry nor are given in marriage. I am not going to have to deal with this in heaven. And you can take the scripture where it says he's engraving you upon the palms of his hand. He'll never leave you nor forsake you and say, Father, thank you that you'll never divorce me. You ought to be praising God if you're going through a divorce, not for the divorce, but in spite of it, it could be worse. God could divorce you. You probably deserve to be divorced. <laughs> Man, you ought to be praising God that he's not leaving you. Amen. Amen. Well, but you don't understand. I'm sick and they told me I'm going to die. Well, you're going to go to be with the Lord. I mean, you can either get healed, which would be an awesome testimony, or you go straight into heaven and, you, and it's awesome out there. We sing about when we all get to heaven, what a day that's going to be. And then the doctor tells you you're going there and you start crying. Something's wrong with this picture. If you were, if you were glorifying God, it'd be like, oh God, this is awesome. And I know some of you think you can't live that way. You know, here's my last testimony. I'm going to have to quit. But when I was in Vietnam, I, this is right after I had had that experience. I was so in love with the Lord that it was just awesome. And I was asking God to kill me, not because Vietnam was bad. 
and I was wanting to get away from all the pressure and the heartache and things like that. But I was, I was so in love with God that I figured the only way I could really have the relationship with him that I wanted was just to go to heaven. And I spent 13 months asking God to take me to heaven. And I was on a fire support base. I was a chaplain's assistant. We flew out there and uh, we were in an area that was about the size of this auditorium. And uh, we took, in, in the two hours that I was there, we took 175 mortar hits inside our perimeter during the time I was there. You could see the muzzle fire from the weapons as the people came up the hill. And because I was with the chaplain, they took us out and we were evacuating. That hill was overrun. And I think there's only a couple of people that survived and lived through it. And so anyway, we were in the midst of all of this fighting. And I can tell you what I was thinking. I had my M16 pointed down the hill, could see the muzzle fire from the other people's weapons. And I was thinking, man, this is awesome. This is awesome. <laughs> Jesus, I'm probably going to be with you before sunset is down. <laughs> And I was just so happy. I was thinking, man, I'm going to get to see Jesus today. I was, I was pumped. And then I got to feeling compassion for the Vietnamese, thinking, God, I know where I'm going, but what about these people? And I was interceding for the people that were trying to kill me. And I know some of you think I'm weird, but I think you're weird. I think you're weird to always magnify your problem. So what if they kill you? You're going to go be with Jesus. I can't lose for winning. And man, I just glorify God and it doesn't matter what happens to me. You know, I've had people say, what happens if you don't get this building finished? What happens if you don't get... Well, the way I look at it is, look what's already happened. God's been better to me than I deserve to be. And if I lost from here on, I got enough to be praising God for. I got nothing to complain about. Amen. Man, God is... Don't